Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast. Good morning to everybody on the West Coast. Happy holiday season. So with me today, I've got James Montgomery. He's our parts and service manager at QPAC. He's been with us since 2019, uh, and he is the self-described Chuck Norris of service. So you're going to get a lot of great information from him today. And normally, we do a great job of highlighting our product or highlighting some of our processes, but we really haven't done uh, anything up to this point about what it's like in the field once you're looking to turn that FS1 on, if you run into any issues or problems with the customer. So today's going to be a great day for James to kind of cover those, the support side of everything, as well as a lot of the field frequently asked questions that we're going to run into. So just a quick reminder, we always go through this at the top, marketing at qpac.com, the email that's listed at the top of the screen. That's a great way to get in touch with me directly. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation or any other QPAC related issues or, or questions that you have, shoot that over to me and I'll make sure you get in touch with James or whomever it is that you're trying to get in touch with. Um, and then down at the bottom, which will lead us into the next slide, we are having our annual AHA AHR party at the Shed Aquarium in Chicago. It'll be the Monday of AHR. So that's January 22nd from 6 to 10 p.m. We've rented out the entire aquarium. We're gonna have drinks, food, a great time to meet the QPAC team. We're gonna have some product demos while we're there. So again, email that marketing at qpac.com or at the bottom of the screen, there's a QR code. You can scan that. And we're just trying to keep a head count because we can only have 350 people there and we're getting pretty close to that number already. So make sure you reach out to us and let us know you and your team want to come. So with all that said, drop any, any things, any thoughts, any ideas, stories that you have in the chat. I will monitor that. I will interrupt James when we have any questions. And from there, I'm going to turn it over to him and, and we'll do support and field FAQs. All right. Thank you, Eddie. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Eddie said, James Montgomery, I've been with QPAC since uh, 2019. Uh, I've been working in the warranty parts service uh, industry for a long time. Uh, if you guys don't know me or if, if we've spoke before, uh, my previous experience, I did 20 years in the military uh, working on Navy ships, uh, just for everything from power generation to ventilation, HVAC, water treatment. I mean, you name it, if it's uh, mechanical engineering or electrical, you know, I, I've worked on it. Uh, and then after that, I spent some time working in controls and then I landed at QPAC and I uh, was able to start off this, this department really from scratch, um, a, a full service support. So support in the sense that we have technical support, warranty support, parts, and we provide uh, online and technical support over the phone. So we got my presenter there. I think he's cueing me that, that I need to track my slide. So here, so, so that's me. You can already see me. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. Whoop, did I go too far? Nope. Next slide. All right. Yeah. So today for this uh, for this agenda, we're going to talk about startup. We're going to talk about technical support. We're going to talk a little bit about our warranty. I'll uh, freeform a little bit on each one of these. I've just prepared some slides with the uh, slide deck Eddie's got together. So we're going to talk about uh, pre-startup checks. So prior to powering this thing up, what are you going to do? What are some things you should check? Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list. There's always things that we can add to this. And uh, and I can keep speaking about this probably all day. If you talk to anybody who knows me, I have the gift of gab, or at least I think I do. I've been told I have the face for radio, though. So there's that. Uh, we're going to talk about common scope gaps, the initial run tests, alarm overviews, technical support, and our warranty process. So let's jump right into it here. Uh, Pre-startup checks. So, like I said, prior to even powering anything up, these are things you want to look at beforehand. Uh, some of this stuff is done by the different trades, and I know there's scopes, but if you're about to do a startup or if you have someone and you need to train them to do startups, these are at least the bare minimum things you should be looking at. So I start with the electrical pre-checks. Obviously, everything is de-energized. I'm going to make sure I obey all local safety, lockout, tag out requirements to make sure that uh, everything is safe to work on, do my initial voltage verification, things like that. But I start with doing a, a voltage verification. So uh, it sounds like a, a, a given, but it happens where someone orders a 208 volt uh, system and they apply for 60 to it or vice versa. That's act actually pretty detrimental to certain components. Um, so the majority of our fans are dual voltage. When you're buying a 208 system, those fans are usually dual voltage, but still that we've got some components that are specific to that voltage. And so you'll need to verify that. Uh, another thing you want to look at is your connections. That's uh, the incoming power and the power that leaves the control panel. 
you guys uh, aren't already aware, the QPAC is a two panel system. If you've talked to me on the phone, this is how I describe it. We got a two panel system. So we got the external panel, it's the control panel. If you guys have been to these unpacks or you've seen our system, you understand this. Um, then we've got the internal panel, the panel that's inside the Airstream. We call that the quick connect box. You'll hear me call it the QCB. Obviously, you're not going to memorize all of these acronyms that I'm going to use. But when I say QCB, that's the quick connect box. So we're going to verify incoming power. That's high voltage, three phase, 460, 208, 220, whatever you've got. You're going to verify those connections. You're going to make sure that they're adequately sized. If you're unsure of what size you're supposed to be using, you can obviously refer to the NEC. If you've got, if you've got the electrical trade on hand, they can help you pull up the NEC. But you want to look in our electrical guide and our installation guide. It's going to talk about what size knockouts you need and the minimum size cable requirements. Obviously, I'll give you some links to get in touch with me directly. As Eddie said, you can use that email and you can talk to us directly. Um, moving from the control panel, the control panel itself has a fused inlet or a fused disconnect. That's where your high voltage is going to come directly from your distribution network or your distribution system, whether that be a panel or a transformer directly, however you've got this wired. Um, obviously, your local NEC electrical codes are, are going to come into play here. Um, <clears throat> that inlet connection, it's a pretty large connection. You're going to make sure that thing is tightened down. You'll notice when you look inside of the QPAC panel that we actually use a paint marker for torque specs. That's a pretty common process in industrial manuf manufacturing, manufacturing, excuse me, where once something is torqued, they make a little slash on it with a paint marker that says, hey, this has got a torqued value and it, and, it, and it was set by the manufacturer. These panels, this system ships in a truck, some kind of freight across the country to get to your site, gets loaded and unloaded several times. You always want to go in and verify high voltage connections and any connections that you can verify are tight. The torque specs for that are in the installation guide. I'll show that in a, in a later slide. The next is the quick connect box, or I call it the QCB. That's the smaller panel inside the unit. It as well has fuse protection and it as well is going to receive the high voltage power coming out of the outlet of the control panel. So that's coming downstream of our contactor. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. High voltage, three phase, either 460, 208, and you're also going to have control voltage there. Um, I say control voltage, that's a misnomer. We're going to talk about scope gaps in just a second, but it's actually low voltage. We call it control, but you may not refer to it on the site as controls because typically your controls is done by a controls contractor. This is actually low voltage and needs to be run in a separate conduit than your high voltage. Uh, then we talk a little bit about the mechanical. So Things you want to verify this pre-startup is get the guide, get the user's guide. I don't have that posted on here, but you can get access to this through our website. It comes with your unit. Get the user's guide. There's an assembly section that talks about how the bulkhead pieces, our bulkhead is our wall that our fans reside on, how those come together, interlocking, forming a strong bond with a channel and where all the fasteners need to go. So that thing needs to be taken a look at. Also, how is that bulkhead mounted within your structure, whether this be a diking cabinet or is this a existing uh, unit, maybe a, a custom built unit or maybe a space that you're installing this in where your old fans lived? How is it secured? Is it secured well enough? You got to think that depending upon the static and the amount of forces that we're going to be applying here with fans, a lot of times you see van axle fans, the bigger ones, they're shock mounted. And they've got these heavy duty concrete pedestals. If they're not concrete, they're steel and concrete to absorb all of the axial thrust that's going to come from that motor. Now we're spreading it across a big wall, sometimes a small wall. You need to be able to prepare for all those forces that are going to come through. And that happens at the installation phase. But prior to startup, you want to check these things because if you run this thing and it's not done correctly, that's catastrophic. Um, <clears throat> next thing, fan mounting. Mounting. Each one of our bulkheads comes with a ledge. That ledge is specifically designed for someone to be able to rest the fan upon, push it into place, and tighten either eight or ten bolts. Those can easily be done. What I always uh, suggest people do is make sure all those bolts are intact. Take a quick look at the fans. Do a visual inspection. Spin the fan. Rotate it. It's not powered up. You're not going to hurt anything. You want to make sure that it's not making any noises, any grinding, any bearing sounds. 
Also, there's an inlet cone or a volute on the inlet side of the fan. Oftentimes, because that moves independently of the fan itself, it is tightened down with 10 millimeter bolts, but oftentimes that can get jarred a little bit and it will come into contact with the blade. There's a very small tolerance for that blade and it's not a measured gap, but if it comes into contact with that blade, it's gonna deteriorate. A lot of our blades are composite, some are, are, are not, but either way, if, if that volute is coming into contact, that's something where you can loosen those bolts and realign that volute or that inlet cone to make sure that it's not making contact. And then again, listening for any kind of obstruction. You wanna, before you spin these things full on, we wanna make sure there's no debris in it, uh, no user's guides left in it, no screwdriver, no nuts or bolts, any, any of those common things. In the military, we refer to that as FOD, foreign object and debris. You wanna make sure that that's not in there. <clears throat> Moving on, next thing. So the beauty of the QPAC system, the ease of install, if you've attended any of these before, is Yes, you need your electrical contractor to connect your high voltage to your control panel, come out of your control panel to your quick connect box. But once that's done, the rest of this is plug and play. And so what you're looking at here is I told you about that ledge. This is where to the right of each fan where we've got these plug locations. You'll see a air port on the left, the control wire, which is a four conductor controls. And then you'll see the high voltage power with the ground. So three phase with the ground. Those plugs are designed to go in only one way. Do not force them. It sounds like, you know, you'd think that's, that's, that's pretty normal, but I've seen it happen. First thing I ask somebody when they're blowing a fuse is, do you have a short? And is it because you forced it in there backwards? Another thing that I like to do is, so these are, these are crimped and verified and tested in our facility. But again, this shipped. Somebody pulled on it. Somebody twisted on it. So you want to make sure that those come together correctly. Make sure there's no massive gap because what that gap's going to do when those two pins come together, that's going to create heat and it's going to create resistance. And that resistance, the byproduct will be heat and it'll eventually deteriorate and destroy that connection, which will lead to a premature fuse failure or a failure of that cable and connection. Um, the pins, the pins get pushed into each one of those Molex and there's a there's little prongs that hold those in there. You just want to make sure those are secure and snug. You don't want to push plugs together and then find out that one pulled out or popped out. It's not common that they pull out, but it's still a good idea. This Your high voltage is going to run through here, especially the one on the right. And then your control wires, that's how you're going to get your individual fan signals. And that's how your fan's going to get its speed signal. <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about this already, so I'll, I'll breeze through it. I got some pictures here. I don't know if they're big enough for everybody to see. But top right, we've got a picture of a, a slice of our quick connect guide. This is a guide that we use to uh, help people make in the connections. What are the connections? This is the low voltage that I was speaking of between the control panel and the quick connect box. Just to the left of that, I've got the connection for the back vac net. And people ask, hey, where does the back net go? Where, does the, where do I plug in my RS-45? That's on C19 on the Schneider PLC. It's a really small picture, but I... It's in our guide. It's bigger. You can you can zoom in on it a little bit easier. And then I've also got here to the left, I've got some of the terminal block locations. We'll talk a little bit more about that. In the controls unpack, uh, Kirk Thomas spoke a lot about this and how to make these connections and what they're expected. And I can go over those and so can my tech team if you need additional assistance, but I'm going to blow through it pretty quick here. Uh, control conduit run. So this has got to be a separate conduit. Um, the premium typically is eight conductor. The basic is six conductor. Our team is currently working on ways to minimize how many wires that we have to run to, to minimize and make ease with this, the installation here. So we've actually recently gone from an eight conductor on the premium to a seven conductor. We eliminated one wire just one at a time. We're trying to make this simpler, easier and efficient for you uh, from the BAS. So if you've got a BAS, you may have a speed signal zero to ten. That's going to go there. Safety circuit. What do you have in this unit that's designed as a safety circuit? This could be um, high pressure, low pressure uh, cutouts. This could be free stats. This could be damper position switches, in switches, um, you name it. There's a, there's a whole lot of things. Door switches, safety cutouts, fire, smoke dampers, a lot of things like that. So 
that safety circuit we'll talk about further is needed for minimum operation in hand mode. And then obviously it'll be needed for further operation. This is essentially what the building or the unit has said. These are the minimum things that I need to run. This can also be jumpered if there aren't any safeties involved. Uh, the start stop circuit, start stop is going to come into play for, for auto. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then we talked about the back net there. So that's RS45. And you'll notice it's got a bias there. So it's positive and negative. <clears throat> All right. Torque specs. I mentioned this just a second ago, so I'm going to rehash it. Um, torque specs are found in our electrical guide. So if you're unsure, you don't want to have to pull up this manufacturer's long guide to find out the torque spec. We've got them listed. If you don't see the one that you need in here, then I, my team can help you get this. We can email you over the, o, the o and m specs so we can get this done right. Make sure you torque them. Torque them. Uh, one of the reoccurring maintenance things that NEC requires is that people go through and make sure electrical connections are tight. But this applies to all of our all of our fasteners, making sure that they're secure. This thing's going to be operating in, in an airstream with extreme forces, not to mention potentially different levels of moisture. And obviously, we're passing high voltage and low voltage through this. We want to make sure our connections are good. Quick question for you, James. Yeah. So Sean asked, does control wire need to be a shielded wire? No, it, it does not need to be a shielded wire. And, and so I'll, I was going to go into that, but I'll, I'll go into it now. Thank you for the question, Sean. Sean asked, does it need to be, I don't probably have to repeat it, do I? Because you repeated it. Um, it doesn't have to be a shielded wire. I do recommend stranded uh, eight conductor or, or six conductor, uh, you know, individual conductor strands. If it's 16 to 18 for control, you're not going to go wrong with using a ground or a shield, I should say, or a drain. The problem with, if you're going to use it, it's got to be terminated properly. So in this case, since it's not required, I just assume not use it. If you're going to use it, it needs to be it needs to be landed on one end or just completely terminated um, on both ends. That'll work too. Uh, the, re the reason, uh, Sean's a good question. Um, main reason people ask this question, and I know he knows why he asked it, but uh, when we're talking comms, actual comms, whether we're passing data, RS-485, or we're, uh, we're talking you know, 232 or any of the other type of data forms, um, you want to have some kind of shield because of different types of induced voltages that can happen. You can essentially, essentially pick up um, different types of flux from different, com different components and they can contribute to changes in distortion in your in your uh, signal. And having that extra drain there will accept those and give it some place to go, as opposed to getting into your comms conductors. Uh, in the comm world, they call that crosstalk. In the electrical world, you know, you're, you're just calling it interference, whether that be radial or you know uh, lines of flux. So, <clears throat> I hope that answered your question, Sean. All right, scope gaps. I mentioned this just a second ago. Uh, this is a big deal for me, near and dear to my heart, because it happens a lot. Kind of related to Sean's question. So what we're what we're familiar with is we're familiar with, and then I've, I've got a picture here of our control panel on the left, and then kind of a cutaway of our systems. And now this is as if the system had the control panel right next to it, with the the quick. It's never like that, or rarely is it like that, but. The scope gap is we're used to our electrical trades running high voltage. They will push conduit. It will be properly bonded. They'll bend it all nice and it'll look great. And they'll run it from the source to the control panel, from the control panel to the quick connect box. And then they leave the job. Well, controls or low voltage has to be run. And I don't mean controls coming from the BAS. I mean low voltage wires between the control panel and the quick connect. So I'm going to like beat on the, on my desk and say, this is a big deal. Check your, check your scopes. If you're a mechanical contractor or if you're reviewing the submittals, you need to double check and make sure that somebody remembers that. And it's generally the electrical it's low voltage, even though it's, it, we call it controls. They need to run a separate conduit, whether that be flex or whatever your NEC requirement is for the low voltage they cannot share the same conduit and it can't just be run willy-nilly this stuff needs to be bonded and passed through you know watertight flex 
or like I said, whatever your code is, but that goes essentially right next to the electrical. And this gets missed a lot. The, the call that I get and that my team feels quite often is, Hey, I've got power to my unit. Won't run. We're like, we begin troubleshooting. We ask them, okay, can you tell me how this wires landed, how that wires? And sure enough, the controls are not even run. Nobody even thought about that. And at a minimum, you're going to need a speed signal going out to those fans. But all those other connections are going to give you those individual fan statuses that uh, we saw in the control uh, thing that comes over BACnet. Give you individual fan alarms. You, you, you need those. And so without that, it's pretty obvious this guy's not going to run. So I think I beat that home. Eddie, did I beat that home good enough? He's not going to answer. Yeah, it worked for me. I was trying to click fast. No, uh, buddy. All right, so the initial run test. So we did the first, the pre-startup. We checked a lot of things. We spun the fans. We made sure nothing was bad. I mean, we did that because when it comes time to start this, we don't want to see some of those issues of the rubbing or bearing issues or debris or anything like that. So now assuming that we did everything and everything's good, we'll go to this initial run test. So typically in the electrical world, we call the first run test the bump test. The reason why we call it the bump test is for Typical AC motors for your AC motors, you needed to bump the motor to ensure you had the correct rotation. If you didn't have the right rotation, then you'd flip two phases and you'd, you'd achieve the right rotation. EC motor does not need phase angle direction or the correct phases to be in the specific place. So A, B, C, they're all hypothetical. The EC motor is only going to spin in the direction that it's been told to spin. I put a sticker on there. Our fans have a sticker. It says rotation goes in this direction, right? And so that's counterclockwise. If you're looking at the fan, so you're on the outlet side of the fan, the air's blowing at you, it's counterclockwise. So um, <clears throat> again, EC motors will only spin in one direction. That's the direction that they're told or programmed to go in. Uh, they can be programmed otherwise. Uh, that's not how the QFAC fan system works. We don't program them to go the other direction. So uh, it, it specifically relates to the characteristics of the wheel and the blade and how it's going to move air. So <clears throat> now this initial run test, we can do this using the handoff auto switch and there's a potentiometer on the front of the panel. You have seen pictures of the front of the panel, handoff auto switch and a potentiometer. Put this guy in hand and you crank up that potentiometer. You do need to make sure that the safety circuit is made. So let's say you're just going to run this and controls hasn't come to help you do this. They're, they're not even there yet, or they're not ready to land their wires. At a bare minimum, you're going to need to make the safety circuit. You're going to need to jump the safety circuit. And I, I talk about those connections. That's between DI1 and 24V. So if, if you make that connection, we expect to see a dry contact there, no voltage. We don't expect you to pull any load on that or to put any load on that. In fact, we've got a fuse in line with that to make sure that you don't do either one of those things and back feed our device. But in this case, if you don't have your controls, you put a jumper. If you do, if you great, if you got them, great. Then then you're you're going to be able to complete your circuit, but safety is the bare minimum. The safety circuit is a bare minimum needed to run this guy in hand mode. Once you've got that and you've done your verification, whether that makes sure you made sure that your dampers are aligned, all your ductwork's intact, or even if it's not and you're going to run it in some kind of safe manner just to make sure that everything runs, then you're going to need to jump for that safety circuit. The start stop is the next one. It's not needed for just this hand mode test. So when we move on to an auto test, you're going to need the start stop to be made similar to the safety circuit. And then you're going to start looking at is the BAS going to control this and how are they going to do that? So first thing you want to do is you want to start them off slow. I mean, these fans are not slow movers. They are Corvettes like Ferraris. They will ramp up. In fact, so much so that we have settings in our controller to retard the ramp up times because they're so fast. So be ready, turn that potentiometer up till about two, maybe three out of 10 and watch these fans spin, go inside the airstream. If you can safely, obviously listen, make sure there's no noises, no rubbing. We already checked that before, but we're checking it again. Make sure none of the cables are somehow coming in contact with the blades. Make sure there's nothing left in the unit can get sucked in, pushed out or blown around. I mean, obviously, th th these are times where you got to take safety precautions, but a smooth operation. We're listening for that inlet cone to be rubbing. So see if we need to adjust it. Once you do that, at about at about two or three, you should start to see some 
indications on the front of our touchscreen saying that the modulation is going up. Right, and I'll show a picture of that in a second. And also showing some CFM. You may not get CFM if all of the, the ductwork is open or if your doors are open, you may need to close those because the way we actually pull that with, is with the pressure transducer, but you do need to verify that that's moving. Later on, that can be calibrated with the controls and the test and balance team, but you should see some CFM. If you don't, then we're gonna need to look into it and say, are we getting a signal from this thing? So um, here's that system. Sorry, yeah. I jumped in a little quickly. Uh, Craig talked about his process a little bit, and I think this is stepping back in topic, but he said, we just always have the uh, controls contractor run the eight conductor. Um, okay. I, I mean, and that works. Uh, having work in the controls industry, I, I, I know that that's not always scoped correctly. So if Craig is scoping it that way, great. Those guys can push conduit and bend it and run it. And, you know, so be it, as long as it falls within someone's scope, because what I continually see is the gap. The electricians didn't have it in their scope. The controls team didn't have it in their scope. Nobody had it. You know, everybody's walking away with a, a job well done, but the unit doesn't run. So so those are just things that you want to avoid. But I appreciate that feedback, Craig. If it can be scoped there, then that's that's a good way to do it. Does that answer his question there, Eddie, or can I move on? Okay. So moving on, we were talking about the system status. I said as you were starting to turn this potentiometer, remember we're running it in hand. You'll start to see this modulation. So you can see on the screen modulation. That one's 41%. It's number five. As you turn this thing up, it should follow. It'll follow that potentiometer. You got it at four. It should be close to four or 40%. So 10, 10 volts being 100%, one volt being 10%. That's the scale that this works at. You should also be able to see some airflow. That CFM will start to build, start to rise as you start to crank this thing up. And then the current value, this is a pretty interesting setting that our, our developers put in. Um, when this thing's chasing or following a PID loop or a set point, you'll see a green, or a red and a green bar. So essentially target and how close it is to getting there. It's kind of filling up that, that, that bar there. It's pretty interesting. There's a little more stuff that you can see on here. You notice there's a date and a time. Those can be done. Those can be verified and set. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that if, if anybody's interested on in how to get to those settings. Um, that's really about it. I mean, you do see system status okay, control type where in, in this case they're in constant airflow. We do have multiple control types, zero to 10, constant airflow, constant set point, uh, or backnet. So those could be either one of those. Or in this case, we're just running it in hand mode. Uh, so it's not obeying any commands other than the potentiometer. So <clears throat> moving on. Alarm overview. So this is a, this is a big talk, a lot, lot of uh, confusion maybe, or just uh, needing some, some definitions. Uh, this is what our alarm screen looks like. So if you fire this guy up, um, before you even turn that potentiometer, if you've got an alarm, it's a good idea to go ahead and address that, depending upon what it is. Not everything is a shutdown. So specifically what we see on here is when you get an alarm, it'll flash. It'll be an audible noise. It'll be a visu visual flashing beacon saying press here for alarms, it'll take you to this screen. And you've got your overview, your alarms, and your events. And so in this case, what we're seeing here is we're seeing an active alarm. Notice there's a, a date under the active, a time. But there's no date solved. So in this case, this alarm would be red, it would be active. And it says code 1000 safety circuit. You remember what we were just talking about? I said that's mandatory to run even in hand, that's a minimum. And so, once this is solved, it'll go green and then a date and time will populate in there. So you can look at your historical logs. You can scroll up and down. So when this sheet fills up, there's a little arrow. You can scroll up and down and you can see what's an active alarm, red, no date solved, or a cleared alarm, date solved, green, right? So you can go back through and, and events as well. So when you switch that handoff auto switch from hand to off, from off to auto and vice versa, you'll get an event notification and that'll be logged on the other page, but the overview is just gonna give you the present stuff that's happening. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what these alarms mean. So I wrote a, <laughs> I wrote up a, a, a pretty long write up on these alarms and I've got that posted on our tech support site. Uh, if anybody's had to troubleshoot any of these before, you know that I've put together this guide on how to solve these alarms. So we'll kind of go through these, but I'm gonna need my glasses. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie, for making it bigger. 
All right. So that first one, safety circuit, we kind of already talked about that. Um, there's only a couple of things um, that could cause this safety circuit alarm to go off. Uh, the first one being that uh, you didn't make the connection between 24V and DI1 that I talked about. That's where we expect to see your dry contact or a jumper. If that's not there, safety circuit's going to always be active. You know, won't run. It's directly in series with the coil on our M1 contactor. For those who don't know, the M1 contactor is a contactor that we've installed, and it's how we take the voltage that comes in, we send it downstream or out the contactor to the quick connect box. So without energizing that coil, you won't pull that contactor in, you won't have power to the fan section. All right, this is not to be used as a start stop. This is a protection device. This is if you have an emergency, you need to shut off power or you've lost a safety, it'll kill the power to the fan section, it'll kill the high voltage. Um, the other thing that's in series is that is we've got a, 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 a contact for the time delay relay. So when the unit is powered up, a countdown begins. We've got a time delay relay. I usually wear their hat, I'm not wearing it today. A time delay relay counts down 11, 10, 11 seconds. What this does is that prevents chattering of that contactor. Um, what could potentially happen is you've got a damper in switch or some other item wired across your safety and it could be intermittent. Maybe it's failing, maybe it's you know a component issue, who knows, but for whatever reason, while that's opening and closing rapidly, it's doing the same thing to the, to the coil and the contactor. And a couple of things can happen. The first thing is it can damage the coil, but even more importantly is it can damage those contacts. So those, as those contacts, come open and closed, you start to get an arc gap there and that arc gap can create heat and resistance and you can actually foul up a contactor. They can freeze closed, they can freeze open. And so we don't want that. That's why we have a time delay relay. That's a safety within a safety. The next few are related to the power meter. So 1001, 1002, 1003, and 1004 are all related to the power meter. So we've got a power meter inside of our control panel that we pull the inlet power and we monitor it. So we're actually checking um, incoming power. And so if it's not within 5% of the rated voltage for this device, then it's gonna be an alarm. This is not a shutdown. So 1001 through 1004, actually we'll move on for the 1005, is not a shutdown. You can have this alarm, it's more of a notification, right? So I'm not saying you should operate outside of the 5% uh, above or below the rated voltage, but it won't shut the unit down. This is more like an, oh, by the way, you know, used, used for later to say, hey, why did we have problems? Well, your voltage was always under or over or something like that. These are, these are notifications for you and the user and the owner of the system to know that they've got a, a, a parameter. Maybe you know your, your, your building runs higher, lower voltage, but it's still within the 5% required, then you won't get this alarm. This alarm will only go off when it's outside of that 5%. Most, if not all, of our components all have from the manufacturer rating that says it's safe to operate this within 5% of rated voltage. You start going outside of that and they cannot be responsible or uphold any warranties for, you know, keeping that device safe and, and keeping it from malfunctioning. So voltage alarm, that's, that's that one. It's coming through the power meter. The power meter, like I said, is inside the control panel. We're uh, pulling legs of the voltage from the input, we've also got a CT. And so going into the next one, that current alarm, we're measuring current. And so if you're operating with an extremely low voltage, since, and I don't need to go too deep into that, but since voltage and current are inversely proportional, you would have higher current potentially. And so either not having any current present would be an alarm, or if it's outside of normal parameters. Um, the big thing about just not having it is if this unit is going to be connected via BACnet, somebody somewhere has the ability to track the power consumption in the form of wattage. And in order to in order to derive to, to, to solve for wattage, you need current and you need incoming power. And so when you're not getting that, you're potentially not going to have that data. Um, it may just be an alarm at this point and not essential. But like I said, it's not a shutdown. Next is a uh, system malfunction. This is kind of a catch-all for the two above it. It's not receiving voltage or it's, it's not indicating current. That's, uh, that's what that one is. So it seems more extreme than it is. I, I think if I rewrote this, it would re read a little differently. But system malfunction, the world's not on fire. 
Okay. It's not a shutdown. It's just saying, hey, there's a parameter in here and we're not getting correct data. So we can't log it um, or, or we can't help you because we're not getting anything. Um, moving on, the configuration error. This one sh should be uh, extremely rare. These, these devices are programmed. We actually input this, this data and then test it before we send you your unit. Stranger things have happened with EEPROM. If you guys remember the, the deal with EEPROM chips and, and battery backups, these are variables that we key into the software, the PLC software. And if those variables are lost, then this will be your alarm. It'll, it'll, it'll not know what voltage it's supposed to be operating at. It'll not know how many fans it's supposed to have. It'll, you know, it'll, it'll not know those things. This is something that my team can help you go through to make sure that your configuration settings are correct. If you don't get, the, if you do get the alarm, if you don't get the alarm, then the assumption is, is everything maintained inside there that we set up. Moving on. So these are the more common ones, the integrator alarm. So 2000 through 2008. Um, we talked about the control panel and the Quick Connect configuration. So Quick Connect A, or the first Quick Connect, can hold up to nine fans in our system. You may not have nine fans. You may have five or four or any variation therein. When you start to grow above a nine fan system, we will typically balance those out. So we'll put maybe four fans on the first Quick Connect and four on the next. We can do up to nine on each of those. And so you can go... Currently, with this alarm structure, you can go all the way to four different Quick Connect boxes, you know, times nine fans. So we've got 2000, 2001, 2002, and 2003. Those are all related to the specific integrator, either A, B, or C, a, B, C or D. If you see one of these, I've got a device inside the Quick Connect box that says, hey, something's wrong with my wiring. I'm not able to perform a true status check of your fans. And because I'm not able to perform a, a, a true status check, I'm going to flag this alarm. So that means that, uh, that that device can't tell you the status of your fans. Um, and that's the same for 2000 through 2003. I've got a list of things that need to be checked going back and verifying the wiring between the control panel and the quick connect box are the first one on that list. It's always ring out your wires, check for shorts, check for grounds, make sure they're not shorted to each other, make sure you've got your colors correctly. In some instances, I've, I've seen people use um, eight conductor wires, but all the same color uh, inside the, you know, not even paired off colors or, or different colors. That could be complicated. You have to ring out each one of your wires. Um, but but that's generally step one. And then I, I could show you my, my troubleshooting guide, but we can go farther into this. What would cause an, an integrated A alarm? That's just a malfunction or an issue in the wiring. Um, if that device fails, it'll also provide one of these integrator air alarms. So I've got a pretty complicated, well, not complicated, a pretty um, well-written guide on how to troubleshoot this. The next one is 2004, a pressure transducer alarm. Uh, you'll see it says disabled. Um, remember I told you when you were running the unit, you, you ramped it up and potentially it took a while for you to see CFM. This was a pretty common thing that was happening. We were throwing an alarm saying the pressure transducer wasn't working. So this has been disabled. Um, maybe future use will add it back. Uh, 2005 through 2008 are for the uh, respective PCBs that we were, we were just talking about. So typically when you get a 2005 to 2008, you've got an issue inside that PCB, whether that be a wiring or you know, there's a, there's an issue with the device itself. So these, these alarms, 2000, all the way through 2008 minus the 2004 are pretty synonymous with each other. If you've got an individual fan offline, then you're going to see a 2000 through 2003. If you've got a, just a miswiring issue and the, the PCB just can't determine fan status at all, then you're going to have a 2005 through 2008. Uh, I think I might've said that incorrectly in the beginning, but 2000 through 2003 are individual or more fan alarms. And then five through eight is, is a miswiring application. I can't hear you, Eddie. Your mic's muted. There we go. So Douglas was asking if alarms 2000 to 2003 are shutdown alarms. No, that's a good question. I, I was, I was hammering that home. No. Um, 
In fact, the only shutdown alarm in this in this whole list is the very top one, and that's the safety circuit. Those are not shutdowns. But what it is telling us, uh, 2000 through 2008, minus the 2004 one, the pressure transducer, is that I may have an issue communicating with one or more of your fans. Um, we independently run the uh, control signal or the uh, zero to 10 analog run signal to these fans. If that's intact, the fan will still run. There's two other wires in our control bundle that are affected by this. And if the PCB cannot detect the status of that fan, it could potentially still be running. You poke your head in there and say, oh, it's running, but it's an alarm. This is probably a comms issue or this is maybe a wiring issue. But good question. So, so nothing outside of 1000 is a shutdown. The world's not on fire. You're getting, you know, good use of your air, of your system. If it's just running in hand mode, you don't even have the rest of your BAS system set up. Not a huge issue. Yeah, you've got an alarm and it's going to be annoying. It's going to go off every few minutes. Uh, you're going to have to acknowledge it or hear it go off until you do, but it's not a shutdown. This is a, a pretty big one, Eddie, if you want to, if anybody's got any additional questions or we can just save them for afterwards. Yeah, we will have an opportunity at the end, everyone, that if you can't type out your questions quickly enough at the end of the presentation, we will have a dedicated question time. So any other questions you think of through the presentation, we can totally handle them there. Sure. And again, as I was saying in the beginning, I've got some some guides that I've put together. Uh, there are they're, they're, lit, they're on our online support portal. I can also share links with you guys so you can have them They're They're phone viewable as well for your techs that are out in the field. They can view them on their phones or tablets. Um, but essentially breaking this down, explaining what each and every one of these is and how to troubleshoot it. Check connections between this point and that point, this point and that point. I list out all the terminals that are used, the nomenclature for the terminals. And I've got some pictures to show what the connections look like. That These are things that, that happen commonly. A lot of times my team uh, moving you know, into the future is let's get it. Let's, let's get a screenshot, you know, shoot me a, a picture of your control panel and I'll help you troubleshoot your wiring or something like that. So we're, we're definitely doing that both online and over the phone. All right. If Eddie doesn't jump in, I'm going to move forward. All right. All right. Next. Technical support. <clears throat> All right, so we've got live technical support. Um, if you guys didn't know this already, on the front of every QPAC panel, we can see it here in the bottom left corner, big letters, Q hyphen, PAC, QPAC, and below that, that's our phone number. That's the 904 number that you see there. You can get a hold of someone 24 seven. We've got someone live. After, after general business hours, you're probably gonna have to talk to me because I'll, I'll get those calls, uh, but we've got a team of people that are, that are taking these calls. You can speak to a live technician. Uh, this isn't a scenario where you call someone today and you talk to them in three days. This is a scenario where we get back to you within the same day. And, and we, we pretty much goal this to make sure that we're getting back to you guys. We don't have long hold queues. We've got multiple technicians that are available um, to go through troubleshooting steps with you or to help you get just any kind of assistance that you need, whether that's a spec, a submittal piece of data, a, uh, you know, any kind of post-sale questions about operation, integration, things of that nature, stuff that we talked about here. Or even if there's a hard question and we need to pose that to our engineering department or someone else in our in our company, we can field those questions. Um, we've also got an online portal. Uh, that's our online technical support. If you go to our website, the qpac.com, you can go to the support tab and we've got like a wiki page there. And so you can go in there and you can type in just a few few characters, you're interested in getting a schematic, type in schematic and you're going to get a bunch of those pop up relevant to your system. You want to get a guide or one of the, the installation guides or user's guides that I uh, that I mentioned so far. Definitely go in there, type it. It's going to pop up. If you don't see the one that you need, maybe you have a system that's a little bit older. And you're doing a startup for it just now. You may have to contact my team with a phone number or email. Get in touch with us and we'll help you do that. Um, using this online system that we've got, uh, you can create, track, and get live statuses for your issues. So when we take it to building, you know, we, we've taken your order and we're building it. Order confirmed, you're going to get a notification. 
you take it to building, boom, it ships. We're going to post tracking. You're going to get a notification that says, hey, your item is shipped. Here's the tracking information. Uh, as soon as that posts, we're going to share it. If you, if you need some additional information or you're unclear, a lot of times my team um, is, is ready to speak on this system and, and communicate with you. Uh, it, it can communicate via email. We can use this uh, through, through the phones, however you want to do it. Um, again, I already talked about the shipment tracking, but you can speak to a technician directly there. You know, the, 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 the days in the future is uh, I may not want to call someone. So, you know, some of the newer techs or they want to text. And so my team's doing that too. So they'll get in there and they'll text with you. I generally don't pick up the phone, but I'll text you too if that's if that's the best way to communicate. Maybe you're in a mechanical room. It's too loud. I know we've all been there. I've been there for many, many years. You get in there and you can't hear, but you can send me a picture and we can text back and forth and we can figure this thing out. Uh, also, part support right there. Same group of people. Uh, they're the most knowledgeable on the individual components for our system. They're going to be able to guide you through, pull up your actual uh, bill of materials for the as built and tell you exactly what part is needed for what, get it on order. We keep it in stock in QVAC. So we keep all these items uh, there. We also have same day and overnight options. So you're doing a startup. You know, the worst thing happened. Murphy was present, right? Murphy, Murphy's always present. So the worst thing happened. X piece of equipment didn't work or, or didn't run, showed up dead. It's unfortunate. We test all these before they leave. But like I said, Murphy's always present. We can get that thing out the same day. And more than likely, we've got some kind of overnight options for you. Now, we cover standard ground shipping. But if you need something overnight, we'll work it out. We'll figure this out. And this kind of just oh. sorry, quick interruption. So Sean asks a great question. We run into this all the time. Um, they Sean is saying that most of their jobs are done over a weekend. Can you speak to what live tech support is like on Saturdays and Sundays and even holidays for that matter as well? Yes. Good, good question. And so it, it, it's actually important that you ask this because we're about to shut down for the Christmas holiday. So QPAC is going to be closed um, for the most part from the 22nd tomorrow through we'll be back on the second right after the new year. Um, if you know something's coming up and you're a few days out or a week or so out, and you know it's coming up on a weekend and you know it's going to be in an odd hour. For instance, uh, very common, Sean, and I'm sure you can speak to this and so can others. I got to take this unit down. I got to put the cue pack in and I got to have it up and running by 6 a.m. That means you've got guys working around the clock on this. My team's ready for that. I'm ready for that. If you know about it ahead of time, please set it up. Obviously, you're not going to know about emergencies when those come up. I list my direct number as an emergency contact. If you've got a QPAC air emergency, and not all emergencies, then uh, then definitely contact me after those hours. But if you know ahead of time, Sean, let's set it up. Email me and, and let me know, and I'll have someone standing by. That way, you're not actually pulling them out of bed. Or, or pulling them away from something they, they already expected to call and they'll be on call for you. All right, warranty process. So warranty hotline, same number, look at that. 863-5300, that's the QPAC support line. You get that, you're gonna get our phone tree. Option one is, uh, is, is technical support. Get everything you need there. Um, if you're doing a startup over the weekend and you need and you need to schedule it with us, you can email us. You can let us know, like Sean was just asking. Um, if you're doing a startup and you need parts overnighted, you know we can do that. Um, we got a really straightforward warranty, guys. We we built this around you. We built this around our customers. The idea is, how can this be the easiest and most solution focused system that you ever worked with? One is to really make our warranty process smooth. And, I, and I've, I've worked diligently to make sure that there's not a lot of hoops for you to jump through to get something. So you call me and you say, this component is bad. Give me the bare minimum to identify the information. I just prove who purchased it and we're going to get you this part. We're not going to make you fill out complicated forms, the RMA process. You're not going to have to jump through a lot of hoops and get your own carrier to schedule stuff. So after we get that, that data, we're sending something, whether that be in a Sprinter van, cross country, or an LTL truck, or it's a small part. We're going to send it, you know, potentially overnight, uh, air, next day air, air AM, stuff like that. We have those options. We keep all of the QPAC parts for all of our current systems in our facility in Northeast Florida. 
as something we're, we're really proud of that you can call us at any time and I can spin you up a part and get it going. Even if it's just you keeping spares, if you want to prepare your technician or your truck or your team with some of these spares, what is the common things that could potentially fail and cause cause uh, us to be down? Let's buy those. Let's get those on, on, on site or on standby, ready spares, bulkhead spares, as you will keep those there. Fans can ship within 24 hours. If you have an issue and you need a fan, now we sell our units with redundancy. You get M plus one and sometimes even better than that. And so the hope and the idea of the design is you lose one fan, continue to operate. In some cases for larger systems, you can lose multiple fans. But either way, you tell me it's emergency, you tell me you need it, 24 hours that fan can leave. If you tell me if you don't tell me it's emergency, then we can get it out in a, in a normal timeline. But it's going to ship via truck, so someone's going to have to unload it. This is, most everything that we ship, with the exception of small components, is palletized. So I'm going to have to have somewhere somebody's got a loading dock, or, or they can unload it, you know, in the parking lot or something like that. Um, the returns, you, you know, you've got a warranty fan. You've got a fan that failed, and it's still under warranty. You've got this five year warranty, so we're doing this, you know. Over time for you, we're available for these four years. So, so we're doing this for you. And in doing so, you're going to need to ship those fans back to me. No complicated process. You call or email us and my team will schedule a truck to come pick it up. And once we schedule it, we'll email whoever your point of contact is on the site, a copy of the BOL to hand the driver and they'll come and get it and they'll be gone. Again, no convoluted RMA process. I know I've worked with some of these large vendors. I've worked with some of these and I've got a warranty. But three days go by and I'm still filling out a paper and waiting on a status and things to get approved. That's not, that's not how we're doing business in QPAC. We're getting you the stuff as fast as we possibly can so you can have your system up and running. Uh, Kurt Thomas says we like to move air real good. Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to move air real good. All right. You guys already saw this. This is a prototype of a QPAC panel. If you guys have seen the inside and the outside of the QPAC panel, this one is... Uh, I think it's I think it's powder coated. It's it's, it's got this QPAC blue. We're kind of proud of our our colors, our color schemes here. But it's also a really clean install. You can look on the left hand side, and, and if you're an electrical geek like me, and you and you like wire runs and how everything is connected, then I look at that and it just it just looks great. I, I see a plenty of room for me to work if I have to. Not that I want to, but if I have to. One of the fallacies is, oh, it'll never break. You'll never have to work on it until you do, right? That's going to be a lot easier. All right, questions. Yeah, while we wait for everybody to type those in the channel, we'll do our quick reminder that we had earlier that we will be having that party at the Shed Aquarium for AHR. So that's the Monday, the first full day of the event from 6 to 10 p.m. Feel free to RSVP to us at marketing at QPAC.com or we have the QR code on the flyer as well as at the bottom of the screen. Reach out to us and let us know you want to come and hang out with us, us and some of the beluga whales and the the penguins and everything like that. And uh, James will be there. I'll be, there. be there. Yeah, come yeah. see, come see yeah. us. Come and hang out with us. We'll be there. We might even see if we can do some of this stuff live while we're there and, and have some of these quick info sessions for everybody. And then I, I know last year we had a uh, a demo unit mm -hmm. that ran. We had um, our selection tool. We had it up so where people could could mess around with our selection tool. But yep. more importantly, you, you get to meet the team of people that you work with or on the other side of that email or that phone. Um, but yeah, I look forward to meeting, you know, each and every one of you. If, you. if you can make it, that'd be great. If you're close to Chicago or you're already going to HR, come and see us. Let's, uh, let's hang out. That's, yeah. what this, that's what this is for. I think we're going to do a live install. They're, they're testing some of our equipment to make sure that it's not going to upset the animals too much, but we're going to see what we can do about having a, a live install there, which will be pretty cool. And the other thing is we love feedback. Like our, our, CEO, our CEO and owner, Matt, always talks about it. We love taking in information and we don't wait for some random rollout date in the future, some date that we're picking. If it makes sense and we can do it, we're going to do it. So we love talking to you guys in person getting to meet you, hear what your problems are in the field, what you love and don't like. And, and then we kind of try to iterate from there. So it's a great time to, uh, to interact with customers, reps, contractors, the works. Uh, yeah. Really like Greg was saying, like having that, uh, that low voltage scoped in with the, uh, with the controls contractor. I mean, that's great. If, if, if you're finding that works for you, that's the type of stuff that we want to use. We want to empower everybody around to be able to do those same things if they work. Absolutely. 
yeah, so we'll keep hanging out here for another minute or two to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I will be sending up a follow-up survey after this to everyone who attended. If you wouldn't mind, it really is three questions. It takes about 10 seconds just to make sure that we didn't miss any questions that you have, any lingering questions, as well as next year in 2024, what is some of the content that you want to see from us? So I was brought into QPAC to be the media person and moving forward, guys like James are gonna get their own channels where from support, we're gonna be able to make videos, audio files, whatever it is that you all need that's gonna make you successful in the field with QPAC, we're gonna do it and we're gonna build it for you and your team. So again, reach out to us directly, marketing at QPAC.com, send us questions, attend quick unpacks, you know, we're, we look forward to hearing from you all. That's so, exactly right, my team can come and train your installers. Let's say you bought a QPAC unit, it's your contractor's first time installing it. I can send I can send some either myself or some of my technical team out and we'll do a supervision. Go over the installation, train them, make sure everything goes smoothly. And those are those guaranteed startups. Someone spoke about how it's critical. I get this going over the weekend. I got Monday morning or bad things happen to have this running. Those those supervisions when my team shows up guarantees that there's not going to be a hitch. Guaranteed. Um, you're going to have the right type of uh, people present. If not, let us train you. Let us let us let us talk you through, walk you through this. And uh, once you get good at it, then you, you know you'll be uh, not needing that. But it, you know it's better to have it, and not need it, than need it, and not have it. Right? Yeah. Dylan even said it. Supervision is well worth it, and uh, we know supervision goes a long way. So, especially like supervision from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, you all, it doesn't seem like we have any questions rolling in right now. So reach out to us afterwards if, if you think of one down the road. Like you said, we're going to be, uh, QPAC's going to be closed next week. Um, some of the teams are already starting to step away, but we will definitely be fully closed next week. We'll be back up the week after um, the new year. Thanks for staying long with us today. This was a great presentation, one that we love to do. We'll look again at doing it for, uh, again in the future. Um, but again, thanks for joining us, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon and hopefully see you at AHR. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, everybody, for coming out.